Genesis chapter number 16. Does everyone have a Bible tonight? We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had in handmaid an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, and I pray thee, go in unto my maid, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband. Abram to be his wife. And he went in, the, in, in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom, and she that had conceived, I was despised in her eyes, the Lord judged between me and me. And Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thine hand, do to her as it is pleased thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Agar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. In our text verse is verse 13 tonight. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Let's go to the Lord. For Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this truth tonight, I pray that your spirit would present it, not me, but you'd simply use my voice to be a, a conduit. And Lord, I thank you for the, the, the strength that you've given me from considering this, this story that uh, we've looked at many times and we know about. Or maybe something tonight that you would just reveal to us in a special way. Well, thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin talking about this is kind of a base lesson as, we, as we're going to spend several weeks, as the Lord allows us, on basically knowing God. Knowing God. And I think many of us know about God. Um, I think we have facts. You say, Pastor, I know a lot about God. That's not the theme. The theme is not knowing a lot about God. The theme is knowing God. Uh, I could quote a lot of verses of Scripture and you could probably quote a lot of verses of Scripture, but knowing God in a more real fashion and instant way. Isaiah chapter 6, we won't turn there now, but we probably will eventually in one of these Wednesday nights, that Isaiah had to come to a knowledge of God before he could fully be used by God. And there's so much about God that in our finite mind we'll probably never completely understand. But when you want to know someone... One of the areas that you will learn about them, not as much today because there's, we don't put as much emphasis on it, but our names. In the Bible time, names carried a lot of weight and carried a lot of meaning behind them. For instance, Adam meant from the earth. Eve meant the mother of all living. Abraham, father of the multitude. Samuel, asked of God. Jeremiah, whom Jehovah has appointed. John, Jehovah is a gracious giver. And, 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 and names were given for important reasons in the Bible time. They're still given for that today, but God also has many names besides just God. 
And this is the first mention of one of his names in Genesis chapter 16. And it's the name, the God who sees. It's uh, El Roi or Roi, depending on how you want to pronounce it. You pronounce both ways. The definition is the God who sees. Let's think for just a moment about this lady that we're looking at her life tonight. A lady by the name of Hagar. A lady who was taken captive. A lady who was basically a slave, if you will. Removed from her homeland. Removed from her family. And she was the slave or the servant of Abram and Sarai, who would eventually be Abraham and Sarah. She'd been forced into a relationship not of her choosing. She had no choice in the matter. And now her own employer is torturing her, all because she is with child by her employer's husband, who again, she had no say in the matter. And the misery that she's under, the uh, the pain that she's under, the persecution that she's taking, taking upon herself. And so now we find her and fleeing into the wilderness. That's what we just read a moment ago. And in the wilderness, we find the angel of the Lord finds her and begins to commune with her, begins to talk to her about why you're here and what's happened to you. And then we come to verse 13. And that phrase, I've underlined it in my Bible because I never really saw it like I see it now. And that is, Thou God seest me. Here's someone, just, just wrap, wrap your head around this. Here's a lady who is minding your own business, becomes a slave of Abram and Sarai, minding her own business. Sarah comes up with a ridiculous plan. We all know that it wasn't, that was not of God. And says, well, I can't have a child, so Abram, why don't you take our handmaid, why don't you take Hagar and marry her and have children by her? Which wasn't God's original plan. So she has no choice in the matter. Immediately she gets pregnant. Now Sarah's upset, taking it out on her. And she flees. She runs away. But in spite of her running and in spite of her going into the wilderness, God still sends an angel. An angel of the Lord. To meet with her and to minister to her. And then Hagar gave a name, gave the name of the Lord, Thou God that seest me. There could be a lot of Hagar type stories in your life or my life tonight. We have been minding our own business, doing what we did, and then all of a sudden, we are forced into something that was completely outside of our control. And the first instance that we would we would go to in that uh, that case is that God wasn't paying attention. But here we can go back to Hagar's life, and we can see that she looked at God and said, "Lord, you are the God who seest me." Your eyes have always been on me. I find that to be a very interesting name that Hagar gave to God. She realized that the eyes of God had been resting upon her. And now God is going to give her some directions. I, I'm going to make three observations. The first observation is this. Number one, God is stronger than you or I could ever imagine. Again, our God is what we make Him out to be. Sometimes in our feeble minds, look, my mind cannot wrap my... I cannot wrap my thinking about how strong Almighty God is. 
I cannot think for the moment and, and, and be able to wrap my head around how powerful God is who spoke the world into existence. But this is the God that seeing Hagar. Uh, this is the God tonight that we're speaking of, that we open our Bibles to and we read about. And I want you to understand that He is so strong and more strong than we could ever imagine. But don't think that He's an impersonal God. He's not a force. That He tonight sees us in this room. He sees the people in the next room. He sees the people in the next room. And this is just one building on one street in one city. See, we, we, we can't... It's, a, it's just beyond my comprehension that every Bible study that's taking place tonight, God sees those people in that Bible study. God sees the widow that has the need tonight. God sees the single parent that has the need tonight. God sees the teenager. And He sees all of it at the same time. God is not separated. God is not bound by the past. He is not bound by the present. And He's not bound by the future. He sees everything in real time all the time. That's our God. Right? So when you, when you wrap your head around that, you think, here's this little Hagar running out. In, and, I, and I know there's a lot of other observations that we make from this text, but you can't get away from the fact that God saw Hagar. You can't get away from the fact that God had His eyes on her and God was watching over her and God was protecting her. And by the way, God's promise was fulfilled. What was God's promise? Verse number 11. The angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael. Verse 10. I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. God kept His promise. And, and I know there's other observations that we make from time to time, and we know that that is the Arab, Arab race that has come from there. But what I want to focus on tonight is the fact that Hagar felt the presence of God in her life. And that God saw her right where she was. Not only does God have eyesight, but God has insight. God is looking at you tonight, and He's looking at me tonight, but He's not just looking at my tie and my dress shirt to see if it's pressed or whatever. God is looking right through me to my heart. He's that powerful. He knows why you came to church tonight. Whoa. Wow. By the way, some of us got our reward already for tonight. You're not going to, because you came for fleshly reasons. He says, you have your reward. You won't get it someday. He knows why uh, we, we do everything that we do. That's the God who saw her. He saw her with, in, in His eyesight. Yes, God can see, but God also has ultimate insight. Think about that. I don't know what that does to you, but that really arrests my attention in thinking. It's bad enough that when we look around and wonder if God's watching, come on, God's got eyesight to see everything you and I do. But it's not a matter of looking around to see if mom or dad are looking around to see if God is watching. God has the insight to know every motivation for everything that you or I do. That's how powerful God is. Wow. He has eyesight. He has insight. Uh, he's also, he's, he is not limited by time. I talked about that a moment ago. Time means nothing to God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is not, he is not limited by location. He's working in the lives of our missionaries tonight. He's working in the lives of your family tonight. And by the way, uh, something to consider. Never stop praying for that unsaved family member to get saved. Because God is not limited by time. God is not limited by place and location. God is not limited. Again, God is more power than you or I could ever imagine. <laughs> We don't know when God is working. We don't know how much God is working. But God is working because, number one, God is stronger than we could ever imagine. Remember, He's watching. But not just He's watching, He's watching. He's watching for the whys. Why do we do what we do? Well, I hope it's because we have a genuine love for God. 
Mm. No, it's because we have a genuine love to please God. And when we do what we do for pleasing God, we know what, we know what the byproduct of that is, meeting the needs of family, meeting the needs of friends, meeting the needs of believers. But ultimately, if we put man ahead of God, we're only going to do it for a short period of time. But if we keep God in His rightful place, and doing it for the right reasons, pleasing God, all the eternal value that comes out of that. So think about it. God is stronger than we can ever imagine. Number two. You kind of mentioned this already. Because if we understand and agree and realize how God... And that's just touching the him. So that's just a little touch of how it's power. I mean, we could talk about that the whole time. But in thinking of that and establishing that, we build on that and we say this statement. Number two. God sees and watches over us. He's like the hen gathering her chicks, if you will. Remember, God is more powerful than we could ever imagine. And I don't know what wilderness you're in tonight, or I don't know what sense of insecurity. I don't know what's coming your way that you didn't ask for. I've got a lot of things coming your way that we don't ask for. I'm going to say this lovingly. Welcome to life. And I'm trying to be cute, but Hagar didn't ask for this. Hey, I don't see in the Bible Hagar, I don't imagine Hagar raising her hand saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. She got picked. She had no choice in that. And see, God is even more powerful than those things that come into our life that we don't necessarily agree with, nor do we expect, nor do we want. But secondly, God is always watching over you. God is always watching over me. Have, have Grab a hold of that thought tonight and think about it. What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. Who is that? That's the God of all. That's the God of the universe. That is the God who is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing that God cannot do. He is the only God. The Jehovah. The God who sees. He already has seen your tomorrow. That's how powerful he is. He's already, he already knows what it is for you and for me. So why in the world would we expect when something comes into our life tomorrow, God's already been in tomorrow. He's already there. He already is there. I mean, I can't even around say it, but I can't even really wrap my head around it. He's already there when I get the bad news. He's already there. He's already there when when that loss comes into my life. He's already there when they lay me off from work. He's already been there. That's how powerful God is. And, and that God, number one, is so powerful we can't imagine. But that God, number two, is watching over you every move you make. Not for the sake of necessarily judgment, although that's part of it, but for the sake of protecting you and protecting me. And remember, God is so powerful, and we might say, well, boy, it sure feels like God's not protecting me in certain areas. Hey, remember, God is God. Don't try to take the Godship away from God. While we don't understand everything that God does, we have to have faith that God does love us. God does care for us. He is almighty. He is more powerful than we can ever imagine. And He is. He sees and watches over us. And this leads me to the third thought. Because God is more powerful than we could ever imagine, He sees and watches over us. But then we find in this text number three that God can supply whatever we need. God can supply whatever we need. Alright, let's look at this tonight. Genesis chapter 16. <clears throat> and Anzor the Lord found her by a fountain of water, verse 7, in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to shore. Questions are exchanged. Notice verse 9. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, here is the direction that she needed. Anybody need some directions? 
in life? God has them. Look what He tells her to do, though. Most of us would have said, are you kidding me? Go back to that? Hey, buddy, I'm going, I'm, I'm going the opposite direction. The angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress. What? Go back to Sarai. Go back to the one who has been mocking you. Go back to that. That's the direction that God gives her. And then notice what he says. Submit. You know what? This is totally contrary to human logic. But God's ways are not my ways. I think that's somewhere in here. God, I definitely couldn't have come up with that. God's thoughts are not my thoughts. God says through the angel of the Lord, He says, okay, here's your direction. Go back to her and submit. Remember, God is stronger than we can imagine. God sees and, and watches over us, and God can supply whatever we need. The problem is, in many times in my life, is I don't think God's directions match what I need. I want, to, I want them to be under my terms and under my directions. And God says, time out. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to have the great nation, and if you're going to have, um, as he said, a, a multiplied seed, if you're going to have all of that, you're going to have to follow me. If, if you're going to have success, there's something that comes before that. What is it? O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Obedience. That's God's prerequisite to blessing is always obedience. How come I'm not being blessed? Well, maybe you're not obeying God. And it might be in an area where you say, there's no way I would go back to Sarai. There's no way I would submit to that. And God said to Hagar, look, these are the directions I'm giving you. If you follow these directions, you will be blessed. Remember, we said God is mighty and God is strong. We love that. And we said God watches over us and we love that. But sometimes God's going to tell us, here's the directions follow these directions, everything's going to turn out just fine. But sometimes the directions don't match what we think they ought to be. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art a child and shalt bear a son, shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her. Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? <clears throat> Skip down to verse 15. And Hagar bare Abram's son. And, a and, and Abram called his son's name which Hagar bear this year. Number one, we said God is stronger than we can imagine. I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying you have to believe that tonight. But I trust that, you're, that my and your actions will believe that. That He is stronger than we could ever imagine. Secondly, I trust tonight that you will consider and, and think about this next day that God sees and watches over us. That's very comforting. That's very uh, challenging. Remember, His sight is not just on the outside. He has the inside. See, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the inside. God looks on the heart. God knows the motives. Wow, that's convicting. It's also, it's also comforting, though. God sees and watches over me. But then number three, God can supply whatever I need. God can supply directions. Turn to Philippians, uh, please. Chapter 4. Verse 
As you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, you notice that the, the directions were return and submit. Return and submit. And this totally contradicted the desire. This would totally contradict the desire of the flesh. Right? Hagar's flesh would have said, no. Okay? What is there in your life that God is working on that is going against the flesh right now? Obviously, God's not going to lead according to the flesh, right? God's going to lead according to the Spirit. But the Spirit and the flesh, there's a battle against the two. It's going on all the time. And everything that God wants you to do, most everything that God wants us to do, is going to be in contradiction to what the flesh wants to do. The flesh doesn't want to read the Bible. But the Spirit says, read the Bible. The flesh doesn't want to obey the Bible. And God says, if you do what I command you, you won't have these plagues. Uh, you, you, if you do what I command you, I'm going to take care of you, and, and, I'll, and I'll supply everything. So God's commands are always contradictory to the flesh. Because the flesh doesn't like the Bible. The flesh wants to go against the Bible. Flesh is the old man, right? I mean, there's very little that the flesh wants to do that God wants us to do. But if we are controlled by the Spirit, when God says, return and submit, how would you feel tonight if God came to you clearly in some way and pointed on your heart and pushed on your heart because He has the insight to say something like, you're not being very submissive to me. That's what angel of the Lord told Hagar, but God, I didn't ask for this. Submit. See, that's contradictory to human nature. God commands you. Love your enemies. That's contradictory, contradictory to human nature, right? Who wants to love their enemy? Not the flesh. But God says, I said love your enemy. He said, I even, I'll even go a step further. Go buy them purdies. Help raise money for the teenagers. Buy your enemy a purdies. Don't charge him. Just give it to him. It's that four-minute work, right? Do good to them and despitefully use you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. See, that's contradictory to the thing. But I, can only, I can't even imagine what it must have been like. Hagar threw those words. You know what Hagar did? She obeyed. She obeyed. She went back. And I think we can learn a lot from that. Philippians 4, you can quote the verse, but let's look at it. Philippians 4.19. God can supply whatever we need. He can supply our directions. But remember, a lot of times his directions are going to be contradictory to the flesh. God says, quit your job and be a missionary. <coughs> what? What about the, how are you going to pay the bills? Quit your job and be a missionary. You think God's ever told that to people before? What do you think? You think God's ever called and, and said that way? Yeah, God's done that. Most all the men and families that we've had in here at some point that are going to the foreign field have had to say goodbye to a pretty good paying job. That is not, that is not logical. But God does not work on logic. Because God is more powerful than we could ever imagine. And God sees every missionary driving down the road raising money. And God will take care of them. He may call them home. He may take them through whatever. But see, here's the thing. If God says do it, would you be willing to do it? See, that's what that's the kind of challenge Hagar was getting. Go back and submit. I think we need to come to the place where God is so strong and God is so big in my life that if God asks me to do something beyond me, I might struggle with it because I'm flesh, but I would say, okay, I will submit to that. 
my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God can supply whatever we need. He can supply our directions. And secondly, and he can supply our provisions. Our provision. Agar was cared for. By the way, that wasn't even a name. Ishmael was actually, obviously the, the, the name was given to Hagar, but that, that decision was actually Abraham and Sarah's. And they still chose the name Ishmael. The Bible doesn't really tell us necessarily, well, it does tell us that Abraham says the name is going to be Ishmael. But look where the name Ishmael was introduced. It was to Hagar in the wilderness. She obeyed God, submitted herself, and what happens? Abraham says, okay, Ishmael it is. <clears throat> Why? I honestly believe the direct result of her submission and following God's You say, well, that, yeah, that's the way it happened. I know that's the story, but isn't that the story, though? Whenever we obey God, God moves mountains. If God's going to move a mountain for somebody, like we look at Hagar maybe as a, a lowly person. But I honestly don't look at her as a lowly person. I look at her as someone I definitely want to model my obedience and submission after. That God said, okay, if you'll go back, the child will be called Ishmael and will be a great nation. That's how big God is. So, is that the kind of God, is that the God that we know? Or do we know Him just for this? You know, kind of like a rat's foot. You know, we're going to look at that for a few Wednesday nights. Some of the names of God and just getting to know God. Right. And He's not a little guy in a box. Hmm. He's not just 911. He wants to provide, yes. Boy, he's got some good directions for me. Right. You know what happens when you follow God's directions? <clears throat> Boy, good things happen. Right. And thankfully, he's given you and me a direction. Right. Let's not be stubborn like men are when it comes to direction books. Read them after the fact. That's my MO. And then there's one piece missing. Or there's one piece that we didn't use. Why didn't we use it? Because you skipped the wrong one. Um, right here. Don't miss the one piece. It's important. Stay in this book and let's find out just how mighty God is. Heavenly Father, thank you so much.